As John Fu once said, when you follow a path, even if it's one you've followed many times before, you always have to pay careful attention. Because today there may be new things on the path that weren't there before. Some of them may be dangerous, and some of them can be good. If you're not paying careful attention, you won't see them. You just trust the path. It's always been this path. You've walked it many times before. There's never been a snake there before. There's never been anything else dangerous. But that doesn't mean there can't be a snake now. And if you're walking in the dark without a flashlight, you put yourself in danger. So you want to look carefully where you're going. At the same time as a John Lee once said, when you walk along the path, there may be little plants along the side of the path that you can that you can eat. So you look carefully. Because paths can have both dangers and unexpected benefits. It's a good analogy to keep in mind as you're following the path of the breath. You breathe in and out how many times? And as meditators, we've probably been watching the breath. Who knows how many thousands of hours? But you never know when there's going to be something new. Either something good or bad in the breath, or something good or bad in the mind. Because it's the mind together with the breath that makes it into a path. The breath on its own is not a path. But the mind interacting with the breath, that's the path. And it's going to take us someplace. When the Buddha set out the Four Noble Truths, pay attention to the fact that when he talks about the relationship between the first and the second, i.e., suffering and its cause. For the cause, he uses the word samudhiya, which means something that arises together. That's what you look for when stress or suffering comes. You want to look at what arises in the mind together with it. There's a causal relationship. But in the pair of the third noble truth and the fourth, it's not a samudhiya, it's, it's a manga, it's a path. In other words, the path doesn't cause the cessation of suffering to be, but it takes you there. And there are many images and explanations in the canon that make this clear. The image of the raft going across the river. You put the raft together and you hold on tight to it as you cross the river. But when you got to the other side, you let it go. Because you're not there for the sake of the raft, you're there for the sake of the, the other shore. But that doesn't mean that you don't hold on tight to the raft while you're crossing over. There's another passage where the Buddha says that the Eightfold Path is the path of karma that puts an end to karma. It's composed of a series of actions, but it takes the mind to something that is not an action at all. So it's not a cause of the deathless, but it takes you there. Here again, the image of the path is good. The path to the top of a mountain doesn't cause the top of the mountain to be, but it gets you there. So we're watching the breath and the mind together with the breath. It is a path, which means it's not the goal of what we're practicing for. But to get to the goal properly, you have to be careful and watch carefully what you're doing, because there may be some unexpected things here. And you want to be alert enough to see them. The texts tell us that when the, the Buddha finally got on the right path, there are two different versions of which of the factors was the first he discovered. One version it was right resolve, and another was right concentration. The two go together. Noble right resolve is the directed thought and evaluation that gets you into the first jhana. You're supposed to put aside thoughts of sensuality, thoughts of ill will, thoughts of harmfulness. When you really stick with that, the mind will naturally fall into a state where it's pulling away from unskillful things. And you've got the breath right here to settle in on. And so then you direct your 
directed thought and evaluation to the breath. In other words, your inner chatter goes to the breath. You want to stay right here. Of course, this builds on all the other factors of the path. John Lee has a nice explanation saying that when the mind is in right concentration, really noble right concentration, you've got all the factors of the path together. Your directed thought and evaluation are looking at where there's any unnecessary stress bearing down on the mind, trying to do away with whatever's causing it. Here in particular, it's what in the breath is uncomfortable, what can you do to straighten it out? And once you've got a sense of ease in the breath, how can you make the most of it? So it provides a good place for the mind to settle down. And you resolve on not going back to your sensual thoughts. You're going to stay right here. Your internal chatter is directed to the breath, and all your activities are dealing with the breath, adjusting it this way, adjusting it that way to see what works. And then using that sense of well-being to provide, as he says, for the livelihood of the mind, for the maintenance of the mind, with a sense of well-being. And you stick with it. Anything unskillful comes up, you just let it go. Anything skillful is here, then you maintain it. We don't just let everything come and go, because that's not what mindfulness means. Mindfulness means keeping something in mind. In this case, you're keeping your breath in mind. And so in this way, everything gets into right concentration. So right concentration gathers up all the other factors of the path. And it's good to think of them coming together this way, otherwise you have lots of different things to think about. But here we have only one thing to think about, which is how is the mind relating to the breath? In the beginning, the main focus is on the breath. When you're trying to get the mind into jhana, you don't take jhana as your object, you take the breath as your object. And you think about it and you evaluate it until you get more and more absorbed in it. And that's when the sense of ease and rapture come, or pleasure and rapture. And then you make the most of them. That's another one of the duties of evaluation. How do you spread that ease around? The Buddha compares it to kneading water into a ball of dough. And you're really good, you don't have too much water or too little, so that all the dough is moistened and there's nothing dripping out. Because what you're trying to do is get a sense of whole body awareness, and it comes best when things feel really good in the body. There's a sense of singleness of preoccupation, both in the sense that it's the one thing that the mind is focused on, and that preoccupation, i.e. the breath. Knees that come with the breath fill your awareness here in the body. And then you stick with this as the relationship of the mind to the breath gets more solid. To the point where you don't have to do any of the directed thought and evaluation anymore. You're just there with the breath. There's a sense of unity or unification. The breath and the mind seem to be one. And you follow this through all the way through the next levels of jhana until you finally get to the fourth, where everything in the body is so well connected, all the breath channels are so well connected, and the body is so nourished with the breath that you don't even have to breathe in and out. And it's not because you're suppressing the breath, it's not because there is no need. The body's oxygen needs apparently are met by the exchange of the skin. Because your mind is so still, the brain is using a lot less oxygen. So you're very still right here. Now there are four jhanas. When the Buddha talks about noble right concentration, he says there's another factor. He calls it having your theme well in hand. In other words, you are able to step back from what you're doing a little bit. When you're thoroughly in a state of concentration, you're there, planted with the breath. There's not much thinking around that, aside from simply the perception holds you there. But the Buddha gives these images of a person sitting looking at someone lying down, or a person standing up looking at a person sitting. In other words, it's your mind observes your mind as it's related to the breath. You're pulling out a little bit, and there's still a little bit of that directed thought and evaluation, the lessons you learned about 
how to deal with uncomfortable breathing, how to make it more comfortable, and how to make use of that. Those questions actually fall under the Four Noble Truths. You know, where is the stress? What's causing it? What can be done to put an end to it? So in the same way, we can step back a little bit and watch the mind. Here you're looking at not only the breath, but also the mind in relationship to the breath. And that's when the right concentration becomes a noble right concentration. You're here with one object, but you're examining it and seeing how is it the mind relates to objects. What does it mean to relate to an object? What kind of relationships do you have? What are the activities going on that keep this relationship going? Even when the mind is very, very still, there are some subtle feelings and perceptions and thought constructs still hovering around the object. That's when you see this. Okay, that's when you can go on to the next stage, which is to gain some dispassion for even the state of concentration. Prior to that, you want to settle into the concentration, and as the Buddha says, indulge in that concentration. There's nothing else you have to do, nowhere else you have to go. You're right here. And then you use that to help peel away a lot of really gross defilements. As you see, as you leave concentration, the mind picks up greed or aversion or delusion. You see how gross it is. And the mind inclines to not go for those things, because it's got a better point of view, a better perspective. When their defilements are clamoring for instant gratification, you say, you've got this right here. You've got this comfortable way of breathing. It's free. It's immediate. It's visceral. And just that fact can help peel away a lot of things that you were attached to before. And then ultimately you use that ability to step back to take apart the concentration itself. When you say that even in these really nice states of stillness, there's still some fabrication going on. There's still some inconstancy. Things go up and down. The level of pleasure goes up and down. The level of stress goes up and down. It's very delicate and subtle, but it's there. And the mind can see that and gain some dispassion for it. Again, that's when it opens up to another dimension, which is not right concentration or right view. We're not here for the purpose of right view or any of the other factors. We use them. They're all activities. Even right view, which tends to be, we tend to see it as kind of the mind's picture of things standing apart from its activities. It's the theory as opposed to the practice. That's what it seems to be. You begin to realize that even right view is part of the practice. Everything we do, talking about the Dharma, that's part of part of the practice. But it all comes together here, where the mind can observe itself carefully in stillness and see what's worth holding on to and what's not, and finally getting to the point where it doesn't have to hold on to anything. I need the karma that puts an end to karma. So this is the path we're following right here as we're bringing the mind to the breath. And it's a matter of being very observant of what you meet along the path. There may be some surprises. So even though it's not what you're here for, don't keep glancing down at the end of the path saying, gee, when are we going to get there? You say, I'm right here. I've got to look carefully right here, because who knows what's going to come up in the path tonight? Always be alert as you walk along the path, because it's only that way you get to see things you never saw before, or as the Buddha says, to attain the unattained, to reach the unreached, to realize the as yet unrealized. That's what this truth is for.